Peace, peace. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Remix Morning Show on Black Power Media. I'm Kim Brown. We got Jared Ball, Kamal Franklin, and like to introduce our guest this morning. She is an, uh, an investigative journalist who has been covering not only police brutality and police violence in Baltimore, but she's been covering the death of Baltimore detective Sean Souter. And she has a new book called They Killed Freddie Gray. The Anatomy of a Police Brutality Cover-Up. I'd like to welcome to Black Power Media and to the Remix Morning Show, my good buddy, Justine Barron. Justine, good morning. Hello. Oh, yeah. Welcome. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Hey. And this is really serendipitous, Justine, because I know we've been emailing back and forth for a little bit now. Uh, so I'm glad this has worked out this way. I didn't know it was yeah. happening, but this is perfect. So welcome. Thanks. I love your backdrop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little little hip hop, yeah. little fiftieth anniversary mm -hmm. hip hop. We're just you know we've been celebrating it so much here lately. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead, Kim. Yeah. So Great. Justine, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for making time to join us, and I appreciate uh, the the work that you put in to the book. They killed Freddie Gray. Uh, for those that may not remember or who need a refresher, um, in April of 2015, Freddie Gray was a, a young man in his West Baltimore neighborhood when he was chased and attacked by Baltimore police. He sustained injuries caused by the police, which uh, inevitably led to his death. And after he died, um, that helped to spark the Baltimore uprisings, which was, you know, several days of people in the streets, um, very upset about the murder of this young man. And then it went into what turned into a, a, a police cover up, failed prosecution of the police officers who were accused of murdering Freddie Gray. And just a, 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 a I, I, I can't call it nothing else, but a, a shit sandwich of, of white supremacy, black political bougie, you know, covering up for the cops. And then the issue of, it, can police even be reformed, even when the spotlight is shining brightest um, on some of the most horrific behavior and conduct? So I, I don't even know where to start, Justin, truly, because there was a lot to get into. So so let's start, I guess, with with what happened to Freddie Gray. And, and if you could just bring the audience up to speed on on who Freddie was and, and what exactly happened to him that day in April of 2015. Sure. Well, the public was sold a story that there was a rough ride in the van, that the van driver took him away from the place where he was arrested and like drove in a kind of reckless way and that mostly he wasn't seat belted. So he was thrown forward and his neck was broken by being thrown forward into the front of the van. So um, this was kind of a, a joint narrative by the Baltimore Police Department and the state's attorney's office that prosecuted some of the officers based on this theory. The mayor was a part of this, the Fraternal Order of Police, City Hall. It was a, a real joint production. And the public by and large bought it because if Marilyn Mosby, the state's attorney then, was prosecuting officers, then if both sides agreed to that, then at least we could accept that, right? Well, it was a fiction and they came up with it pretty much right after he died. So they waited until he was dead. He was in the hospital for a week. And so, you know, the, there was a part of the public that thought that maybe he was killed before he was put into the van. And that was based on a viral video. The viral video showed an officer kind of um, holding him in, in a kind of like, um, you know, his legs bent over. He was flat on the ground, like hog tying 21st, 20, you know, first century version. Um, and uh, then he, when he was put in the van, he was screaming and his legs were dragging. So a lot of people thought, well, it looks like he was already hurt, right? And so, yes, he was already hurt, uh, according to my investigation. However, his fatal injury was, a, what happened to him was really never made public. It's a whole other story. And it happened around the corner from his arrest at the second stop. And there were um, a, a large number of witnesses to it. He was thrown headfirst into the van. And so, um, you know, by all measures, and I think the book lays this out, and I haven't had anyone read it and say, I don't agree with you, that this was how he was killed. And so the um, work that was put into suppressing that moment was uh, impressive. If only the police 
solved crimes as well as they helped cover this one up. That's a heater of a statement there, Justine. I mean, th there's there's so much to get into because it's like, well, first of all, why were the police even engaging Freddie Gray in the first place? And, you know, reading your book, it, it, it helped to correct my misremembering of it because, you know, the, the, the narrative was, oh, Freddie Gray was was selling drugs. That's why the police was was chasing him that day. But that's not even the case. And come to find out the police were even struggling to try to figure out what to charge him with once he was in custody. But he was already deeply injured by that time. And you mentioned that the witnesses, that there were plenty of witnesses who saw police not only beat Freddie Gray, but tase him as well, which the police denied doing. And then part of the cover up involved the suppression of witness statements, uh, Marilyn Mosby's office failing to call witnesses who were credible um, and and her office just wasn't interested in hearing from these people in court, which I'm, I'm sure you can get into into that. But then the cover up went as far as them blatantly manipulating um, CCTV footage and and trying to distort um, when and where Freddie Gray actually sustained his his fatal injuries. Yes. And I think when we look back on all of this, it was a very extensive cover up. You know, the first half of the book or so talks through the the six stops of the arrest. The, the van took this long ride after he was arrested and police had a, a, an allegedly good reason for each of these stops. And so, you know, I deconstruct that, share the real story. And then there's also a lot of history of Baltimore policing <clears throat> and the, the structures of it so that so that people who aren't familiar with the criminal justice system can understand why these things happen because otherwise they just seem senseless and then it seems irrational, but this is business as usual. And then the second half of the book goes into all of the systems that help cover it up. The medical examiner, like you said, the, the force investigation team, the video evidence, the media, Marilyn Mosby's office, et cetera. So I think that the reckoning that has to happen when you look back on this, and I would hope people that were involved in helping to sell this story, including media folks, I would hope not that hopeful, but that they would take, you know, have a reckoning and, and look at how easily they bought into things. And the Baltimore Police Department sort of knew they had an easy mark with the media and the public that they could play around with the video and that if they just if they just released enough videos that were confusing, nobody would really say, wait, why is the clock still running, but the screen is freezing? You know, that is not actually possible time and space are together you know um so yeah i think that's i think every everyone including in the prosecutor's office the brazen witness with which they knew for sure that they would pull this pull one over on the public because they knew that there was not going to be anyone to hold them accountable that's i think where the reckoning has to happen so just to jump in quickly so i just want to be clear too so one of the things that you're saying through your investigation is that the fatal injury or the, the injury that damaged the neck was was done by the police physically throwing him into the van and hitting his head. Yes. Um, yes. So the autopsy and all of the medical experts in court and the doctors in the hospital confirmed that the injury is this kind of injury that only happens when someone, it's like a shallow water diving accident. That's what they said. You dive and the, the surface is too close. And so your, your vertebrae flip. And so for people who thought, well, the officers put a knee in his neck. First of all, we're not sure that that happened. You know, I wouldn't say it didn't happen, but it's not clear on the video. But even if he did, even if they did that, that wouldn't have caused that fatal injury. And so what happened was the medical examiner, you know, her autopsy report has a narrative, which is like, well, maybe he stood up and possibly or probably was thrown forward while the van was moving because she didn't know about all these witness statements. And the act of throwing um, people into a van, boom, is still happening and, and was happening. And I have other cases of it in the book. And so when Mosby says, you know, we, we now have seatbelts in vans, everyone's seatbelting, it's like, great, good. But the thing that happened hasn't been fixed. And then really quickly, getting to Mosby a little bit, uh, they decided to prosecute. Um, and if I remember correctly, they charged, uh, I think, second degree murder. Um, and then there was a lot of debate around was the charging too high, so forth and so on in terms of the legal community. Um, 
what do you and and then others, of course, uh, organizers or folks on the outside who've always been suspicious, of course, of the prosecution, thought that this was a and I'm going to put myself in that category that this was basically a mock trial. Like this was not something that they that they they knew going into it that they would confuse the jury and would probably lose, and they were okay with that because they can at least say they brought the charges. Yeah. I'm curious from your investigation. Based on the fact that they decided to bring the charges, mm -hmm. and of course they made a fanfare about how they wouldn't bring him to prosecute, what went wrong during the trial from the standpoint of why did they, in your, you know, why do you think they didn't secure convictions considering even if the idea was uh, that the person tumbled around in a van and that's how they got injured, still showing, you know, caused by the police, the deaths is caused by the police in terms of, of, of how he died. <laughs> Where do you think things went wrong in the actual trial? I mean, this is another one of those questions where you have to ask, where did things go right? You know, it was just a mistake from beginning to end. Um, <clears throat> so the judge, you know, there were bench trials for the last three. You know, the jury, there was a jury trial for William Porter and the jury was split. You know, some of them thought, well, look, he died in police custody. That's all that matters. You know, clearly something happened. And, you know, Porter seemed to admit that he saw him at one point and didn't call for a medic right away. So that's enough for me. But there was no conviction. It wasn't enough. And the judge was pretty clear, like, y'all haven't proven anything. You have this theory of when he died based on nothing. There was this video of the van making a wide turn. It really didn't look like a rough ride. It was literally just turning a little wide, you know? Um, so that was the judge's perspective was you have not proven anything about where this happened. And, and that's true. I, I actually would did not particularly personally find a lot of fault in the judge's decisions in terms of that. The thing is, is that Here's what I think really went wrong. Marilyn Mosby and her two deputies took a lot of her, 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 two, her two deputies in particular took over the case. None of them were prosecutors, really that experience. Mosby had been a prosecutor for a bit. The other two very briefly, most of them were civil or criminal litigators and they did not know what they were doing. And they, when Mosby announced the charges, she read this incredibly detailed narrative of all the stops and of what the cause of Freddie Gray's death. And it was based on no investigation practically. And later Mosby admitted, we based it, and her deputies admitted, we based it on what the cops said. So you're letting the defendants who you're calling liars in court tell you what happened at stops four, three, four, five, when you can't have it both ways. You see what I mean? And so when she read that really detailed narrative, I think she politically locked herself to it. And they hadn't investigated yet. And frankly, they didn't really investigate until after the first trial, which is bad. Yes. Uh, because they started to change their story after the first trial about something incredibly key. And the whole their whole story fell apart. Um, they were scrambling. And then the thing is that she did file these charges like assault and manslaughter for <clears throat> not seat belting someone. So that's, you know, the implications of that. <laughs> like, think of all of us who haven't seat belted at one point or another being charged with manslaughter because we should have predicted that a death would happen. They weren't sound charges. Like, even if you read Maryland's assault, second degree assault law. If you read it, second degree assault, which was all, almost all of them got, like there's no room for what she claimed happened. It's either battery, attempted battery, or, you know, or threat of battery. Like it's not, not seat belting. So it was, uh, yeah, it was. And then in court, um, she sort of just invited a lot of um, administrative Baltimore police employees to talk about how they had inspected the van for seatbelts. It was a bizarre case. So all of that. I hope that answers it. So after what you've talked about so far this morning has occurred, Freddie is grabbed up, he's killed. There's this absurd investigation and first trial. I'm I'm curious, having not had a chance to see your book yet, um, do you get into what happens immediately after that in terms of the the uprising the the uh and and the the origins of that i am still fascinated by what 
little in quote unquote investigating I've done and when I was there trying to pay attention, the story of the the uprising and the protest to me seems highly suspicious and suspect. Uh, so my as a you know after that preamble, my first question to invite you to to share what you uh, learned about that is where is that that first tweet that of the purge in the schools? Did yeah. you get into that yeah. and what and could you talk about that and what else what else what what you've uncovered. Thank you so much for asking me because I've done a little handful of interviews and nobody's asked me about this. And it's really one of my favorite chapters in the book. I definitely do. The story of the uprising is not as it was told. It seems like you're aware. So um, where I come from is twofold. The first is the story of the organizing on the ground and what really happened at the beginning. I think people don't understand that this came out of his neighborhood, that they were his neighbor many of them witnesses who literally just marched to the police station because they were tired during that week of silence before he died and demanded answers and that grew. And so the story of um, movement building was something that I talk about. And then of course the story of what happened when there were two nights of rioting. The first one was a bit more organic because they marched to the um, Oriole Stadium, you know, and some clashes happened, but it wasn't exactly organic. You know, there were police cattling protesters. So what happened th then on Monday was the night of the funeral. And so I definitely break that down. Um, the rioting started because police provoked, um, provoked them. There was nothing going to happen that day. It was a, it, the story of what happened at Penn North is bizarre. And it is about police allowing certain actions, provoking them, parking a car in the middle of the, a police car in the middle of the street and letting it sit there for hours, having cars, police cars catch fire suspiciously and letting them sit there for hours, having a whole line of cops around the corner from the CVS standing there while hundreds of people go in and out looting it. So this was, uh, if there was a pur, so you spoke about the purge, there were a couple of um, propaganda campaigns that day by the police department designed to provoke a riot. And I think it's, it's very, some people might hear that and be like, oh, what? No, but this happens, you know, and I talk about the history, like the Miami model being this kind of common model in policing these days that when there's a mild protest, they try to spin it into something violent. And Commissioner Batts at the time actually already had a history of this in Oakland. So yeah, I definitely lay this out and I'm really glad you asked about it because I've uh, been wanting to talk about it. Uh, yeah, no, I can't wait to, 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 I mean, cause they were bringing police from PG County in Pennsylvania before the kids even got out of school. So right. what, like, I, like it was, what was really going on here? And yeah. then this mysterious tweet that says, white supremacists are going to attack these kids at the school. I mean, because a lot of the students, I'm sorry, a lot of the students that were that were involved were end up in my classroom like shortly thereafter. Like some of them graduated and ended up coming to my classes the next year. They would talk a lot about the, the or, and, and, then, and then many of them had been familiar with that neighborhood and that Mondalman bus exchange was and and all of them were all of them were suspicious of it of of the whole thing from the beginning specifically and I'm going to stop here the specific the, the one part that they said made them I'll never forget this my students said the story is a lie because it's because uh um when 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 the police started pulling kids off the bus that's what the kids said was suspicious and they yeah. started saying was was the police provoking them because they said historically whenever there's a beef or there's a problem with the kids at the mall they make the kids stay on the bus as a, as a way of calming and and making sure no nothing gets out of hand so they said as soon as we started getting yanked off the bus they were like there's this something anyway so sorry for all of that but no, I just, no no thank you, you know. i mean I would like to write a whole book about all of that. You're right. It's like what happened at Mendelman, it's shocking. You know, they they locked it down. They locked it down and didn't let the kids go home. And then they put out into the media that the kids were throwing rocks at them. But by that point, they had been so provoked. A lot of the kids were just trying to get away. And then those kids ended up at Penn North. I mean, the amount of trauma that these city leaders were willing to inflict on everybody 
to not have to deal with what happened to Freddie Gray. You know, I think there, I, I don't have, I didn't really have the space or time to get into the connection between all those provocative actions and the cover up of Freddie Gray. But I think if you look at the timeline with when media leaks were happening and that happened, you could see that it was a distraction campaign in part. And it worked because the media not only bought into the story that somehow these kids were purging and rioting out of nowhere, but they they forgot about asking questions about Freddie Gray's death. Mm. And there was there was so many things happening concurrently as you know Freddie Gray's death is being covered up by Baltimore police and getting some help from the Baltimore political establishment. But around this time is when Baltimore police shot at Keith Davis Jr. thirty times. Right. And and in in your book you go into how you know on. on out, out of one side of her neck, Marilyn Mosby was, you know, vocally trying to prosecute these six officers for Freddie Gray's murder, you know, a- allegedly trying to control or corral police corruption and police brutality. But at the, on the other side of her neck, she's going out of her way to prosecute Keith Davis Jr. four or five times for a, a murder he didn't commit. Um, and, and and intentionally targeting him, his family, and his supporters. But uh, at also the Gun Trace Task Force is also happening at this exact same time where this specialized group of so-called elite Baltimore police officers are planning guns and drugs on citizens, are robbing citizens, are, are just being gangster thugs out here on, on the streets. And it, it really reflects the, the, the clusterfuck that was and is continues to be Baltimore policing where, you know, this, this front facing, you know, we're, we're here to help the community. Meanwhile, doing everything they can to to hinder, to impair, to harm the community. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of the same leaders involved in all of these things. You know, I think when the Freddie Gray case was going wrong for Marilyn Mosby politically, locally, you know, um, and Commissioner Batts was fired and kind of used as the scapegoat. Commissioner Batts was fired about a, a couple of months after the riots. And he was, and the excuse was kind of crime, crime shot up and also his handling of the riots. And in a way, yes, his handling of all of it was a disaster. The investigation, every piece of it, the department. But a lot of the people that really had aided in the cover map were advanced under, you know, after him, including Commissioner Davis. And so Mosby created kind of an alliance with Davis, like we're gonna repair this political damage. Um, and I, th- I imagine Keith Davis was one victim of that alliance. You know, it does look like that was the decision making, but her office was protecting cops in the Freddie Gray case too. I mean, the Lieutenant that was most responsible for what happened to him and the cover up, she never played his statement in court and they fought to keep it out, the prosecutors fought to keep out a statement, a statement's really incriminatory. So the protection of cops went on the whole time, even as they were being charged. And a lot of people find that confusing, but hopefully, you know, it's clarified in the book. It feels like, you know, I don't want to say Baltimore is unique in terms of its policing or police department, but I do want to say that maybe it feels as if when I hear stories about Baltimore policing and the corruption and the organized corruption, it seems to be more advanced than a lot of other police departments Mm -hmm. and what it's able to get away with, how well it's organized. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, to be, to be blunt, it's, I don't give a fuck attitude towards its interactions with the general public. Can you talk a little bit about, again, not a unique police culture, but the police culture that has allowed it to sort of, be this sort of leading edge of of police violence in the country almost? Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question. So far, this is my favorite interview. Um, (laughs) That's a really great question. I love speaking on that. So yes, you know, when I talk to police officers and other, um, you know, uh, departments, a lot of them are shocked by the business as usual in Baltimore. And I'm talking about, this is me interviewing cops so I can understand evidence handling you know, things like technical things so that I can understand what's been mystified to the public. And I've definitely run into, wait, they do that? You know, even the way the force investigation team was put together, it's very sloppy and it's really designed to allow a lot of flexibility in criminality and covering up on the force. Um, So yes, I think you're right about that. You know, my take on it is like big picture. 
that Baltimore has been um, a place for corrupt individuals to kind of be like vultures because they're, you know, it's a city that has some money, not a ton, but it has some money. And um, so Baltimore corruption, I think, is tied to its poverty and um, its location near DC, you know, what it, so people use it to advance themselves. And in particular, a lot of, um, I write about this, a lot of police consultants, um, like, I don't know if these names will be familiar, but like William Bratton, Chuck Ramsey, like these kind of big time, they, they did not do good jobs where they were police leaders, but they've made a killing at like, making money off of places like Baltimore and setting up systems that won't work. And I think what happened is right after Freddie Gray, then there was the gun trace task force. And it looked like for a minute, they might just disband this department because there were, I think four commissioners in a row. They, they had somebody, that person got arrested, a commissioner got arrested. The next one was temporary. They brought in someone with a bad record. It was like so many that I thought it would finally happen. And, and honestly, even police officers I spoke to were like, they need to take this over. Like this is a disaster. But what, it, what happened instead is they brought in the consent decree, which is like a federal program. And, and the consent decree is supposedly like, we're gonna punish this department by holding it accountable to the federal government. But ultimately it just worked to legitimize the department. Now it's back in business. I hope that answers that somewhat. This is something I'm really interested in. And I think that this is the part of the argument against police reform that people don't necessarily understand or a lot of people don't understand. Certainly a lot of you know, people in the community understand that, like, that it's this, it's this money-making racket and that the worst leaders are getting paid to reform the problems they caused. And that it's never meant to reform, really. It's just meant yeah. to, like you said, it's meant to cleanse the, the, the policing enough or the police system enough or that particular department enough to keep it going, yep. claiming that it's un operating under new management. Basically, it's a store that's right. always operating under new management. And so therefore, we're supposed to believe that the rats and the roaches or the dirtiness or the, the bad grade it got from the health department is all gone away because it's operated by new management when basically it's been sold to the person's cousin. Um, and they were just like, you know, putting a new name on it and it's continually doing what it's been doing. So, yeah. Same police consultant agencies brought in to reform every time. Mm. And then it falls apart. Justine, I, I can't thank you enough um, for, for joining us this morning. Uh, the, the book is, is exceptional. It's titled They Killed Freddie Gray, The Anatomy of a Police Brutality Cover-Up. And, you know, she, she gets very technical and, and, and explains the evidence as presented um, you, it, it is a searing indictment, not only on um, Baltimore policing, but the Baltimore political landscape on the Baltimore media. Um, and what I appreciated about the book is that you gave voice to Freddie Gray's neighbors, to, to West Baltimoreans and to people who have long experienced police violence. I appreciated, you know, um, Tawanda Jones being quoted uh, who, who's, whose brother Tyrone West was murdered by police. And, and Tawanda has been a, um, a, a very... Um, active person uh, uh, against the 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 cruel system of policing there in Baltimore, and I and I appreciate you giving voice to these folks because th the media, Baltimore media, long ignores them. Like, and I and again, I appreciated you and um, uh, Amelia at one point, you know, walking the streets of Sandtown and actually talking to people and listening to them because oftentimes the mainstream Baltimore media. Uh, just like police, you know, fi finds these these black Baltimoreans not credible and doesn't give credence to what they've seen and what they've experienced. So I, I, I appreciate you doing that in this book. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for your support. This was a, a really I enjoyed this interview a lot. It went places I've been wanting to go. So thank you. Wonderful. Right thank on. you, Justine. Thank you so much for making time for us today, hon. Huh?